One of the things uh, Dave asked is, we are um, a sponsor, so he said this, is, this may be my chance to talk a little bit about Monk. Um, Monk began about six years ago uh, as I was uh, involved in church planning in San Diego. And um, in the past, I have done some dot-coms and, and uh, started some other companies. And as uh, I was involved in the church planning world, I just really had a desire uh, to see how technology could further the gospel. And so um, one of the things that I did as I built a website for uh, the church that I helped start is just learn how to do search engine optimization. I trained myself in CSS and HTML and all sorts of other things that I never thought I'd ever learn. It was like learning a new uh, Klingon language for me, but I did it. And optimizing the sites, we got to about, I think, number two in San Diego for San Diego churches, um, which with San Diego had such a transitional population with a quarter of a million students. And uh, now it's going to have one of the larger military presence in the world. So people are coming through. They are looking for a church. And more and more people were showing up on Sunday. And so it just felt like there was a, a powerful tool that how could we use this for other churches and ministries? And so um, that was in 2006. Uh, we started building some technology, um, some partners and I, and then growing. And uh, one by one, we just added different churches and ministries. And we've uh, been doing that uh, for the last six years. Uh, and it's just been a, a pleasure to, to do it and really doing it uh, with a pastoral perspective. Of how, how do we use technology uh, to further the gospel, to help churches really gather people, uh, connect people, and deepen the relationship and engagement with local churches. Um, so that, that is a little bit about Monk. Um, so uh, I know a number of you are using our technology with Ecclesia 360 uh, and other things. So for that, we're, we're thankful. And that's, uh, that's my plug. Um, as we talk about tonight, I, many of us are in the ministry space and are talking and thinking about, you know, where is uh, technology going and how does it affect our ministries? And so uh, Dave and I have the, the privilege of maybe just throwing a few things out there uh, for us to think about as ministry leaders. One of the things I've loved about this conference is it seems to attract people that are a little bit uh, deeper thinkers in these things. They like to think through some of the theology and some of the implications of where technology is going. And it's not just pragmatic in nature. And so I hope tonight we're able to just hit a couple topics uh, for us to think about uh, as organizations, as we're stewarding and we're shepherding the, the, our use of technology. You know, how can we use uh, and, and take advantage of these tools, but kind of wrestle through where things are going. So um, we're going to rotate, and uh, I'm going to start and do one, and then he's going to uh, do the next. So the first one I looked at was uh, how technology changes organization and people. And really, you know, we, we talk about uh, technology is really becoming a layer between who we are and how we view the world. Uh, more and more, it's a lens in which people are accessing the world around them, uh, they're experiencing more things through their phones and through technology rather than just one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And it's becoming this layer, you know, even for churches, um, we're finding a lot more people are looking for a church online first. Uh, some of the research we've done has put it up in the 20 percentile where they're finding out about the churches they attend online before they even knew it existed. And uh, the same congregational studies that we've done have shown that about 60% of the people um, are saying that the website is somewhat to very important in, in their decision to, make a church, uh, to attend a church. And so we're, we're seeing these implications for churches uh, where in the past you could just be the community church on the corner of a, a street and people would you know, show up. Um, but uh, that, that kind of era is changing. As uh, people are becoming more and more digital natives, their experience and their engagement with church is different. So this layer is, is adding a new impact for us as ministries and church leaders. The second thing uh, we talk about is really we're becoming more dependent on it. Um, as we have our cell phones, I know we've all forgotten more cell phone numbers than we've remembered. Most of us probably you know, remember maybe one or two people. Anyone remember five or more cell phone numbers? 
I didn't think so, right? So out of this group, there's no one that has that, mem that much in memory because we have learned to outsource that. In fact, there was a New York Times article that talked about the more, uh, if we can Google something, the more likely that we will be willing to let that go from our memory, right? And so we're becoming dependent on it. And pretty soon, just like cell phone numbers, you're going to walk in and, and you're going to be able to forget people's names and how you know them. And you're just going to be able to project and kind of see, okay, that's right. They're, that's how we're connected. That's who they are. And, uh, and it's, that's going to be helpful for some of us, right? But uh, really, this is uh, the dependency that we can now outsource people's names and, and how we know them. And uh, I know even when we talk about um, how this technology is shaping us, researchers are determining that um, it's impacting our very brain chemistry. That um, in the past, you know, we, we could spend some time reading scripture, for example, and we can delve into it uninterrupted. Um, and now, as we're becoming more and more distracted, we kind of need that fix uh, of technology. So when we get a text message and that, that noise goes off, it, it releases chemicals in our brain and our, our brain responds, and we're wanting that more and more. And so you know, as we're uh, becoming a culture that's much more uh, skimming and, and kind of you know, just only so deep, right? And so these are the ministries and churches where people are attending and are part of what we're, we're doing. Um, really, you know, I look, I love this quote. Um, this is one that, that I, I love being alive in, in this season. I think we have a great opportunity um, that we, we talk about this transition that every few hundred years throughout Western history, a sharp transformation has occurred. In a matter of decades, society altogether rearranges itself, its worldviews, its basic values its social and political structures, its arts, its key institutions. Fifty years later, a new world exists, and the people born in that world cannot even imagine the world in which their own grandparents were born. Our age is in such a period of transformation. Do you guys feel that? You sense that? And that is, uh, for me, that's something that I think we, we kind of get to be this bridge between generations, where this transition has happened. And many of us were not raised with technology. We weren't born into a place where we were online right away. But that, that shift has happened, right? And these digital natives are really being formed in the image of the web, right? And, and as you look at um, social media, for example, I don't think it would have taken off the way it has today if it had been around in the 50s. Right? Because people's opinion and respect for authority and a lot of the other things that were in place because of the values and the culture were there um, really would have prevented people from making a fool of themselves. And there probably would have been just a little bit more of a hedge against that kind of social media environment. But you see social media with the values and the way that culture has changed has kind of become this perfect storm where it has exploded because it aligns with the values of our culture. Right? And so we are in that process where we're seeing this transformation and we have a responsibility to look and kind of peer a little bit in the bend that we're in, where, where we have a foot in the past enough that we understand some of the values of the past that we need to hold on to, but we also understand where things are going and we can start preparing for that and training people up based on the values we're learning and the values we're gaining. Uh, as we work with organizations, one of the things we talk about is just how, you know, we've seen these charts about how much faster things are being adopted. The consumption rates, the adoption rates of smartphones, of, you know, all the different technologies that we have. And, you know, I think those are things that are interesting, but I, to me it's the profound effect of going from a place where when we would communicate, it went from months to weeks to days to hours to instant. Uh, and, and a lot of organizations are struggling with making this shift. How do we deal with an instant culture, individually and as a, an organization, as a ministry? And so as we look at these three shifts, I, I look at three acts of the story. You know, the act number one that we went through with the web was the, the vast availability of information being made available. 
And I would look at Acts 2 as the pervasiveness of the cloud where it's affecting more and more areas of our life. And I think we're entering into the third act where our lives are reorienting around the technology, where more and more our behaviors are being shaped by the very technology that we use. And for organizations that are thinking these things through, you know, I know Guy Kawasaki talked about um, companies that used to harvest ice, and they would take ice and bring it, and they'd sell chunks of ice. Those companies did not become the, the warehouses that started manufacturing ice and distributing ice. And then the companies that manufactured ice didn't become the companies that became refrigerator and freezer companies. Not many companies can make that transition between that big of shift. And so you're, we're seeing right now ministries and churches are being affected by this. For example, ministries, we're seeing uh, some ministries that are struggling connecting with younger generations. And so as certain uh, age groups are dying off, they are not replacing them with new donors and new people who are supporting and funding their ministry. Or with churches, you know, I think we're seeing a bit of an attendance shift. Uh, Ed Stetcher talks about there's 70 to 80 percent of all evangelical churches in the U.S. have either stopped growing or in, in decline. And in some ways, I, I think there's kind of like a, to the rich go the spoils. There's certain mega churches and cities that are gathering more and more people that are more accessible, more found, are making it easier. And for whatever reason, those are often the churches that are growing at the expense of a lot of other small community churches. And the landscape of church is shifting in a powerful way. And it'll happen in our generation. Um, you know, even the, you think about Facebook, Facebook recently bought Instagram, and we know part of the reason why is children, 13 and under, it's the first time where their parents were on Facebook before them, right? So most people use either equal or they got onto Facebook and then their parents found out about it later. But this is the first generation where their parents are already on it, they don't want to go there. And so they're skipping Facebook, and often they're going to um, mobile-only apps, and they're not even doing web-based versions. And so Facebook is trying to figure out, how are we going to make this shift, right? What are we going to do? And so you know, the purchase of Instagram, and just recently they announced that they are going to start allowing children under the age of 13 to join, right? And so they're looking at these things where, you know, they're trying to address the very shifts that we're uh, experiencing, but it's happening faster and faster. If you're in technology space, like Facebook and these others, I mean, you are here today and gone tomorrow. And so these are some of the trends that, that we're seeing that are affecting ministries and organizations. Uh, and it's the first thing that I think we as ministries and leaders need to consider. All right, thanks, Drew. Um, so we're just going to kind of round robin it here, and, and my first point for what I think is kind of the current state of digital ministry is probably not going to be a lot of a surprise to some of you. And I like to put it this way, we live in a post-website world. Now what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that your website, your church website, your ministry website, your university website, is probably not going to be the primary way that people will interact with you online. I look at it this way. I look at it as the, the website is your stake in the ground. The website you have to have. It has to be the place where people can go to get information about you. But how are they actually going to interact with you? Well, again, not a big surprise to everybody here. Through social media, through other channels such as Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, this is where you need to be. This is where your organization needs to plan. According to Alexa, I just looked this one up today, I just looked up what are the, the, the most visited websites. And you can see that we have search engines, social media, one portal, search engine, Wikipedia, another search engine, and Twitter. So where are people going? Well, they're going to social media and they're doing search. So what should we do as ministries? We should make sure that we're in those places as well. Just in the last year, social networking surpassed portals as the number one activity of people online.
And I even threw up Twitter here. Um, Twitter is one of those kind of strange animals that most of us in this room understand, but if we go out and talk to people out there in the world, they don't understand what it is. And it, but, it, but they understand it's important because everybody's talking about it. So I thought I'd take, the, there's a, this research here done by um, Pew just in the last few months of the usage of Twitter, and it is slowly increasing, and I think it is a force to be reckoned with as well. It's another place where people are going to get information. I also asked students at Biola, where are they spending their time? What sorts of social media are they using? And as you can imagine, Facebook, over 95% of students here at the, on campus use it. MySpace still got a smattering here, but Twitter starting to grow as well, and Pinterest, a brand new at the time, this is from a couple months ago, uh, was growing fast. These are the places people are going. This is the places we need to be. Gray Matter Research also just released a study where are people going online to find out about faith, spiritual type of issues? Facebook, discussion boards, Twitter, and then blogs or such, um, and Twitter again. So why am I telling you all this? Well, the goal here is to be sure everyone's aware of this. A lot of people in this room are, but I'm also interested in the people who watch this video. I'm interested in people who are leaders of ministries and churches who are still just trying to figure out how to do a website. And I want them to understand that the first thing you need to think about is we are in a post-website world. And the result is, the implication of that is, they need to get in the stream. And that's what I call this, that's why I love this picture here, it's relaxing. But it also gives you this idea that people need to get in the stream. Now what do I mean by get in the stream? Well think about your lives and how you consume media all day. You get up in the morning, what do you do? Check your email, maybe, uh, check Facebook, uh, check, I don't know, the news. We all have habits, right? I call that our stream. We have a stream of information that we put in front of our faces. Maybe it's on our phone, maybe it's on a computer, but we have habits. That's our stream. And what we want to do as ministries and churches, we want to figure out a way of how do we make what we have to say part of that stream of information that people put in front of their faces every day. Do we get on Facebook? Do we do something on Twitter? Do we send out emails? Or even, as one of the things you noticed, what was one of the top things people did was they visited search engines. Are we sure that we can be found when people want to find us? Don't think, well, I have a great website, so everybody's going to go there. That's not the implication here. The implication is great. They may find your website, but first they're going to hear about it from a friend on Facebook. First they're going to see a tweet with a link to your website, or they're going to be searching on something that's interesting to them, and the result will be that they find your website. Now what I'd like to do is just give you a, a couple of examples of who's doing this sort of thing. And in this case, it's not a ministry. It's Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A here in La Habra, which is about probably less than five miles from campus. Um, they do an amazing job of social media. Almost every student on campus here knows about Chick-fil-A, knows when they're having their specials, knows the secret passcodes to say on rainy days to get a free sandwich. We don't get a lot of rainy days, but we get them. And so Chick-fil-A has utilized social media, specifically their Facebook page. Um, here's an example from um, February. Good morning, looks like it's going to rain today. Do you know what that means for the La Habra Chick-fil-A? Just a post like that, and you'll see we already got 15 comments on there, or what they did at the time. They also do things where they partner with Biola and they post pictures. So here's what they say to do. Make sure you tag yourself if you're in one of the pictures. So uh, that's Irene Neller, she's our director of marketing here. She taught a class in public relations and she took her students down to Chick-fil-A and they took all kinds of pictures and posted them in Facebook. So now all these students who go to Biola five miles away are going into Facebook. Oh, there's my picture, tagging themselves, tagging their friends. It's showing up all over social media, just through Facebook. So I put Chick-fil-A and, and I've presented a similar presentation before and, and Chick-fil-A still is one of my best examples of an organization that really gets how to use social media. And I'm not sure if it's particularly this location of Chick-fil-A, because there are other locations that don't seem to do it quite as much, but, but they do a fantastic job. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Another one about getting in the stream is one that you guys are doing here. So it's kind of a plug for something that I've built. 
This text message reminder thing that you could subscribe to, this is what the, the sign-up page looks like. This is just some software I wrote for some students here at Biola to help them remember to do their assignments. That was the initial impetus behind the creation of this. But I'm using it for other things so that you can have people subscribe to text messages and then they'll get the text message. Now that's getting in your stream. I'm thinking of it this way. I'm thinking, what's the best way if I need to tell everybody at the conference about something? What would be the best thing? Well, if I could send them a text message, it actually will be in their pocket. I'll have a message that ends up in their pocket or in their purse. That's a way to get in front of them. Yeah, I could send you an email, but if I sent you a text message right now, most of you probably would take out your phone and look at it, right? If I sent you an email, you wouldn't do that. I'm not gonna send you one right now. I should have scheduled one to come right in the middle of this just to see what happened. Um, anyway, so this is a tool. If you guys haven't signed up for this, not everybody has. Um, See, I don't have the link right now, but I've sent every, all attendees got an email at one point how to do this. Just come see me afterwards, I'll, I'll show you. And I think uh, you tweeted it. You remember, Chad, was that you that tweeted it? Somebody tweeted it in here. It's in the Twitter stream as well. He's looking at me like, I don't know. Anyway, that's the end of my first point. So in my opinion, post-website world is where we're at and you need to get in the stream. So Drew? All right. Uh, number two, I have the growing appification revolution. And really, as we're looking at the growth of apps, in February, there was 725,000 apps in the uh, Apple iTunes store. Uh, 25 billion apps have been downloaded. And as we see that the mobile web versus web, that app consumption has increased beyond just the web consumption. And so this application revolution is taking place where people that, you know, have their mobile phone within three feet of themselves 97% of the time. And so, you know, as we talked about earlier, again, people are being made in the image of the technology that they use. Their behaviors are being changed because of the apps. And I think this is something we're seeing more and more. It is something that uh, is going to just grow. Part of that is through gamification. There is uh, a tremendous power around this concept where more and more you know, gamification has a goal, it has rules, it has a feedback system such as progress bars or badges, and then it's voluntary participation. So there's all sorts of apps out there. Uh, one of my friends uh, just raised $12 million and he's been running this company called Mogul. And he has built an app where every time you go to a restaurant and you've used your credit card, um, you participate and you can win the jackpot every month of a restaurant where a percentage of all the, the transactions go into this pot. And so this gamification is driving more people to eat at the same restaurants and they're tracking the behavior because they can look at the credit card statements before and after and it's, it's profound. They're, they're shifting and seeing shifts in behavior because people want to win this prize, right? And so gamification is something that we, for whatever reason, just totally uh, get suckered into. And it's a lot of the world is based on this. I mean, you could even start thinking about um, college is a gamification system, right? You voluntarily attend Biola. There's rules, there's a goal, there's feedback systems and you get into that. In fact, one professor changed his grading system from the typical A, B, C, D to experience points, and if you hit certain experience points, you leveled up, right? Those students outperformed uh, compared to a sample that did not do that, they did like a grading system, right? So we, for whatever reason, we like to win, we like to compete, and so gamification uh, is shaping us, and I think in many ways, the church is late uh, to the party. And you can see this is a, probably a secular party because there's a glass of wine and all that kind of stuff. So. But you know, we, we are often late adopters. And I think part of that is just because um, of the cost. I mean, it's amazing to me that there's companies out there that are, that are selling churches um, you know, web apps for you know, $10,000, and it's really nothing but their content being delivered. There's nothing unique about what they're doing. But you know, I think churches and ministries are still trying to figure out how do we use and build apps to engage our end user. I believe that every organization, whether it's a church or ministry, there's kind of three kind of ways that you could look at it that are all part of the same thing. 
One, it's they're a corporation. They're, they're kind of their own entity. And we saw in the web, a lot of us got our website up and our you know, corporate site was up, our identity was being created, and it was put in front of everyone. But at the same time, they're a community. There are people that are gathering. And I think we've seen this where, as uh, David has said, you know, let's get into social media, get into the stream, engage your end user. And so, yes, we are a community, and we're working through how do we do that? Do we create private communities we talked about at lunch? What are the tensions around that? Do we go on Facebook, private groups? We're, we're still all kind of working through, but I think we have picked ways in which we're trying to engage our community. Um, the last part of what we are is a cause, right? So if we're a corporation, a community, and a cause, this is the area I think we've done the least amount of work, but it's where things are going. How do we actually interact with people and further our cause in ways where their behavior and their experience is, is kind of being melded with what our organization is about? How can they you know, participate in building a well in Africa and feel like they're actually experiencing things and they can engage and there's, you know, there's a lot more of an app and a way in which they can participate in the very building of that well? That there maybe is real-time feedback about, hey, we hit a, a rock layer and we're going to need to raise some more money. And so you know, it's actually trying to find ways to intersect in their life beyond just being a community but getting them to maybe go out and they could get a little square and they could uh, card and they can actually ask their friends to donate and right then and there start raising money. And you're releasing a whole community of people who you've sent this square uh, you know, piece into and they're actually doing transactions for you, right? And so you're mobilizing the masses in a cause level, right? And I don't think we've understood how to do that yet. I think that's where we're going. Um, in, in fact, uh, in, in the church world, I believe the, the holy grail of this is going to be how do we do discipleship? How do we as churches really communicate and connect with our uh, people in a way that we're reminding them and connecting them on so that this sermon isn't just a, a once a week event, but it becomes strung throughout their whole week. And there's questions and there's increased participation around the scripture passage that was preached. And so it's not just a one-hour event, but it becomes a way of life where you're creating a word-centered people around these things and mobilizing them. And so we're seeing some things where people are trying to do this, you know, whether it's Monvi, uh, whether it's you know, different you know, uh, feedback systems, Bible mesh, there's some things that are going on. But again, I think and for the most part as a church, you know, we are late adopters. This is, you know, for us at Monk, this is something that we're committed to and passionate about, we're thinking about, we're building, we're working towards this, because I think we as ministry leaders have to start investing in these technologies. And then I always, uh, like uh, last year I, I did a little bit of this, but I always like to think about, you know, one of the things that we have that is a little bit dangerous is the unintended consequence of technology, right? We, so we, we talk about the air conditioning unit. Um, can you think of an unintended consequence of the air conditioner unit. Okay. Right. It was this atom bomb to community, right? It wasn't designed with that in mind, but people went from living on their front porches to moving back in their homes, shutting the doors and living in an air conditioned environment. So the, the air conditioning creators were not in an evil plot to destroy community, but that's an unten unintended consequence. And so I think as we're navigating these things, I think we have to have discernment as we talked about how technology shapes behavior. So if you think about the Bible, we talk about things like the printing press. You know, what's an unintended consequence of the printing press uh, within the Christian community? That was negative. And there's, there's, there's a good part of that, right? But then now all of us have our own individual Bible, and you have denominationalism, you have individual interpretation, you have all sorts of things that begun as people kind of work through the Scripture on their own, right? 
So it's an unintended consequence of that technology. It's the same as we talked about with chapter and verse. You know, we love that we have the printed Bible. We love that we have chapters and verses in the Bible. But now we can approach our Bible as an encyclopedia or a dictionary and read it for fragments and lose the story. Right? So that's an unintended consequence. Um, and I think the same thing is with the Bible apps. You know, as we build some of these apps, as we engage in some of these things, what do you think is an unintended consequence of having the Bible as an app on your phone and reading it and engaging it that way? You can skip the parts you don't like. So you kind of just jump right to the verse. So I think one of them is, is people are going to forget the books of the Bible and where they are and the order because you just hit a button, you've got this list, and you push that. Again, remember, we outsource our brain. We don't have to remember that anymore. And so now we are just going to skip to the verse. You know, for, for me, I think... This device, there's tremendous distraction, right? So all the little messages that can pop up and all the sounds and all of the things. So, you know, how, do, how are, you know, are we reading it with, you know, it on airplane mode or something so everything's turned off? But we can become very distracted and fragmented in how we approach the Bible. And so we never kind of get enough of a reading because we're just doing bits and pieces and skimming the surface. Right? Uh, you can think about as people now are maybe even adding their own notes, we can kind of have the Wikipediafication of the Bible, of interpretation. You, know, you can have all sorts of other things. Um, I know for me, just the, the tactile reminder of the notes or that coffee I spilled in that moment in time when I read that scripture, there's all this value in that. Right? So what I've said is I'm waiting for the Bible app where it kind of ages as you flip the pages and you, know, you can... Like, Put in coffee stains as you need them, right? Just so you can kind of have that experience. So again, the appification revolution is taking place. We as ministries have to think about how are we engaging the lives of the believers who often have this phone within three feet of them 97% of the time, and it's shaping their behavior. We have an opportunity, but we also have to be wise in how we use it. All right, thanks, Drew. I saw a couple people walk in late. Do you guys want to come on in and take a seat while there's a quick break in the action? So the next point that I want to get to, you have up here on the screen. Do you guys remember, maybe, maybe I'm going to age myself here a little bit, but you remember the communicator in Star Trek? That was like the most awesome thing, right? Now do you guys remember what happened in the next generation? Where's the communicator? His badge, right? They just talked right into their badge. So that was the future. We were looking at the future. And then these things came out, pretty close approximation. Actually, I think iPhone can do more than a communicator could ever do. And now we can even have one that's attached to our body, similar to what we had in Star Trek The Next Generation. So mobile is no longer the future. You know, two, three years ago, I would say, hey, mobile's it. We got to start getting ready. Now I'm saying it's already here. You better be ready. So just like post-website world, you got to start thinking beyond just having a really good website. You need to be thinking about mobile devices. Um, Google said a couple of years ago, this is two years old now, Desktop computers will be irrelevant in three years' time. And I honestly think that in some ways that is true. I don't think they're ever going to go away. And we, we've had some discussions even today about the iPad and mobile devices and what's their value in relation to a computer. And we could probably all debate in here the pros and cons of that. But I think if you're honest, you'll note that especially for the up and coming generation, the mobile device is the go-to device. The iPhone, the Android, that's the go-to device. That's the one as as Drew was saying, they always have with them, right, within just a few feet of them. This, uh, this chart here shows technology adoption over some different technologies over the past 100 years. And we'll see back here in the 20s, even right through the Depression, uh, a radio adopted out to close to 100%. It took a few decades. TV went a little bit faster, and then the internet went about at least as fast as that. And now 
We're in a fourth revolution, we're calling the mobile internet. People accessing the internet on mobile devices and it's ramping almost straight up. This is from the Facebook um, statistics page. Just in the last, what, this March 2012, so about two months ago, 488 million monthly active users out of 901 million. So more than half use mobile devices now to access Facebook. That's just one benchmark to think about. The Pew uh, Research Group, the Pew Internet Project, um, looked at the changes in smartphone ownership over the last year. And you can see we're, we're ramping up from just in one year from 35 to 46% now own a smartphone and the other cell phone is dropping. I truly think we're at a stage where we're gonna see everybody in the first world, in the United States, having a, what we would say is you know, a high-end iPhone, or the equivalent of that, in the next two to three, maybe five years. Most people will have that, and I truly think that within 10 to 20 years, what we see as the best iPhone possible right now, what's that, the 4S or the Phantom 5, but the 4S, that's gonna be the standard phone throughout the world. That may not be Apple, Apple's name won't be on, but a phone that does those same technologies. And so I, I encourage people to think about, if you're trying to plan for five years from now for your organization, for use of technology, for um, evangelism purchase purposes, for teaching purposes, think about in five years, don't, don't plan for today's phones, plan for five years from now. Think about what the best technology is today and start planning as if everybody has that because we know how it works. Think about what the best technology was five years ago in smartphones. That's pretty much what we all have, right? Right before the iPhone. So think about that. We all have that or better. Uh, this is just to look at the demographics from that same study by Pew Internet. And I want you to note the change in smartphone ownership across the board is positive. Even in less than $30,000 households, different race, ethnicities, different education levels, different geographies. It's all going up. It isn't just, you know, rich people buying new phones. This is, this is happening across the board. I was in India a little over a year ago, and we were in a very rural area, and it was not uncommon to see a guy riding a burro, pulling his ox cart, but he was on his cell phone. On his cell phone. It's worldwide. It's definitely, and that'll be, next time I'm up here, I'm going to be talking about that point. Uh, Spiola students, I also ask them, um, how often do you surf the web on a mobile device? Um, over 50% said yes. How about checking email? Very high percent. Or even Facebook, as we saw from Facebook's own studies, this just bears it out. Over 50%. Mobile use of the internet is pervasive, and I say it's really becoming, if not already, the primary way to access the internet. So that gets me to my big implication for my point. My implication is you should be thinking mobile first. You should be thinking about making sure that your whatever ministry you do digitally works on one of these, works on an iPad first, and then make sure it also works in other environments. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at someone who did that. You all know about Uversion, right? 50 million downloads. Big success story. Um, last December, I was at a conference, the Mobile Ministry Summit, and one of the, uh, the leads from the um, Uversion team was there. And he was telling a story about how they'd created the Uversion Bible um, website, right? It was a, it was a web um, Bible. And it was successful and people said, hey, this is neat and you can do some neat things. And then one day they were all sitting around at lunch and said, you know, we should make this work as a mobile app. And they all got very excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah we should do that. And he said, they made it a mobile app and the usage of that thing went up 10, 20, 30, 100 fold to the point that that's now by far the primary way people use Uversion. It's not, you know, the website's nice, but it's the mobile app. And if any of you have tried it, I would encourage you to get it. It's an awesome way to look at the Bible, even with some of the caveats that Drew pointed out, uh, notwithstanding. So, of course, that means that we should all create mobile apps, right? Mobile apps is what we should do. Well, hold on. This study came out just a little while ago. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen it. 
If you spend, they will come. It turns out success with mobile applications is not guaranteed. A lot of people really think just like, I don't know, five, six, 10 years ago, it, everybody said, hey, um, we need a website. We just have to have a website. Well, why do you need a website? Because well, we have to have one. Now everyone's saying, well, we need a mobile app. Well, why do you need a mobile app? Well, just because we need a mobile app. Don't just build a mobile app because you think, oh, we got to be mobile. That's how you're supposed to do it. The, the statistics tell you that it's expensive. If you're trying to do it to make money, it's difficult. Um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of marketing. 80% of apps don't generate enough revenue to support a standalone business. So don't think of an app as a way to make money. Don't think of an app as an automatic success. It needs to be something strategically thought about for your company. Now, what can you do? Because you say, well, wait, Dave, you say, Mobile first, right? So what are we supposed to do? Well, many of you, I'm sure, know the answer. Um, and I think, where's Antoine? Right here. Yeah. Responsive design. You talked about this in your session today, if I remember right. Responsive design. It's a way of creating a website so that it will look good on a mobile device. And it will look good in um, really any device. Now, I'm not the technical one. Antoine will be able to answer many more questions about responsive design than me though I'm working with our Biola uh, web design team on a website for our school of business, and I told them I want responsive design. I want it to look good on mobile devices. If you can create something that's a website that will look good on mobile devices, you only have to create it one time, and it will look good on an iPhone, it'll look good on Android, it'll look good on an iPad, it'll look good on any device. And isn't that the goal? It's easier to maintain, right? And it'll essentially end up being easier to use. Now, I just have a quick example here, I, and I'm not promoting this particular festival in any means. It just is the one that I, um, yeah. Actually, I didn't test this on your computer, Drew, so we'll find out if uh, the link opens up. Yes, but I have to move this to the other screen. All right. This is an example of a website that was built in responsive design. Now, how, how can I tell? Well, because they told me it was. But um, I want you just to notice something. So here it is full screen. So you see it looks pretty much like a normal web page. If I shrink this thing down to maybe what would be the size of an iPad, you notice that the, the graphics shrunk and the pictures reformatted themselves to stack up on top of each other. And then, let's see if this works here. I guess that's as, that's as thin as it gets. But depending on the size, it actually recognizes the size of the screen and will resize, restack, reformat. This is one example. I'm not telling everyone, oh, you got to go do this. But what I'm saying to do is think about your website, think about what you're trying to do online digitally, and be sure it looks good on mobile devices first. Because it is more difficult right now to make things look good on mobile devices than it is to look good on a computer, you know, on a, on a standard size screen. So that's my takeaway from this, um, is mobile first. You're, you're up, Drew. All right. Let me get this thing out of your way. The last uh, point that I have is really have a clear plan and reduce friction. Um, this, is, this is something as a... Uh, David said, a lot of organizations said that we need a website, we need mobile, and they have a me too strategy. And as we've worked with them, it is the, the rework they have to do is incredible. So, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this uh, tomorrow, but it's really doing the hard work up front where you're working through what is the purpose of your organization, what is your mission. What is your vision? What are the values that you hold dear? And then how do you build a digital strategy? And I think it's all too often people are just repeating what other people do. They see someone else does it or they're just slapping things on the web. And so I'll give a number of case studies of just cleaning that thinking up and becoming very clear on a very few important things, how that radically changes an organization and the results that they are getting from being online. So do the hard work beforehand of thinking through who you are, why you're there, and what you can then translate to the web. 
Um, and the other thing I would say is focus on the lowest common denominator. Get out of the way where you're having to be a gatekeeper. And how do you then connect with the broadest of your communities and really serve them and release them to be a community, to engage in your ministry or your church? Connect them. And so, you know, to me, this is kind of like the law of the lid. As an organization, a lot of times we impede upon and create friction where we can release people to connect, whether it's through social networking or private communities. There's things that we can do to really allow people to live out the vision of values of who we are without having to be the gatekeepers. Um, often, this means as we're working with churches, you know, a lot, the studies have shown that the more decentralized you are if, versus being centralized, the more success that you can have through social networking. So again, for a church, this means really uh, walking away from this mentality where a church, director of church communications is a gatekeeper, where everything goes to them, and then they move to a role of consultant. How do they then work with the department heads, with the ministries, and work with them and consult with them and build a plan for them and release them so that, for example, they're able to create content on their own. And then maybe as the, the ministry leader, as a director of communications, you're just looking at and kind of editing for the theme or content or some elements like that. And so you're, you're using a broader base of your organization. You're you know, finding ways in which you can engage uh, the people that are your biggest fans. Uh, one of the things that I love about like Compassion is where they uh, got uh, uh, different bloggers to go on a trip and share their experience and how powerful that was, right? And getting people connected into that is important because uh, if, if you've studied a bit about Facebook and EdgeRank, you know, you need to find a way really to be awesome uh, four times a month. You know, that um, with EdgeRank, if you are not liked and or if people don't respond and connect to you, I think it's within seven days, you basically, they never see you again, right? They, they, it's not going to naturally appear in their wall. So what, 94% of people that like something never go back to that page. But what happens is if enough people like and engage and share something, Facebook says, okay, I think this might be valuable. I'm going to serve this back to you just to see if you're still interested, right? And so there's a whole process of having your community participate in these things so that you are staying in, in people's top of mind, that you are engaging in a broader community. And so there's a whole methodology around that as a ministry to get out of the way and engage your broader base to be your biggest fans and promote what you're doing. So the last point that I have is one that I've already touched on a little bit, and that's, you know, we're, we're in a post-website world. We're looking mobile, and finally, we're looking global. You put something online, it's immediately available worldwide. And I want you to think about the fact that, this, that the web is no longer US-centric. Uh, some statistics for you. Global internet users in 2011. And what this has got here, not only is the number, right, in this column here, in this second column, this first column shows how many new users in the last three years what the average year-over-year -year growth is and what, penetration, what, what percent of the population is actually using it. So you can see the biggest upside, the US, we're at 79%. Some of the biggest upside is in China, India, Indonesia, Philippines. These are fertile markets. If you have ministries, evangelistic organizations, churches that are looking to spread the gospel, to spread the good news, to spread what you do to these countries, um, there's just so much upside, so much growth coming there. Another interesting statistic, a little different look this time. Who uses social networking? And it's mostly Facebook. Um, the average number of hours per month. Israel is the number one user of social networks. Who would have thought, right? Um, followed by Argentina, Turkey, Chile, Russia, Philippines. We're down there, what, about 10th or so. So social networking isn't just an American phenomenon or a North American phenomenon. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And what we're seeing here then is the ability again to connect with people all over the world using social networking. We're not just looking locally. 
We talked about mobile. It's not just happening here. 85% of the world's population is covered by a wireless signal. That is more than are covered by the electrical grid. More people can have cell phones than can plug in electricity. It's fantastic. It's just, it's just an amazing thought. And I truly believe we're to the point where in just a few more years, that number will, will go much higher, 90 plus, 95 plus percent. That we can make the assumption that in a few years, if not in just a couple years, that we can reach just about every person in the world with what we'd call a wireless or a mobile phone signal. Doesn't mean they're all gonna have smartphones yet, but we're working on that. And then you were talking about India. Uh, 200 million farmers receive government payments via mobile devices. So I wanted to give you an example of a company that does this well, and I don't know how many of you know of Jesus.net. Um, I've worked with them for a few years. I've talked with them, interviewed uh, the head of the organization, and they do a fantastic job of thinking globally. And maybe because they're based outside the U.S., it makes it easier for them to think like a global organization. They're based in France. But what they do is when they decide they're going to reach a country for Christ as an evangelistic organization, they don't just turn on a website and say, okay, everybody, come to us. They do their research. They partner with local churches, with local missions organizations. They research the culture, and they develop a website, a web presence, and mobile websites that are specific to that culture. And it works fantastically, and they, they roll it out slowly. This isn't just, you know, they don't just have one website for the world. So they have uh, peacewithgod.net, which is for Americans. Topchristian.com, I think, is their original one, which was the French one. And they just opened up um, a Japanese site, Hope for Living. And most of these have mobile components as well. So what I want you to think about is when you want to go on the internet, when you want to look for tools to reach people for Christ, I want you to think about um, not just saying, well, one size fits all. It's global, but it also requires you to do careful study of each culture, of each nation, of each language to determine how are you going to reach that organization or, or that country and those people. I think that reaches the, the end of our presentation. So that gives us, I know we were kind of going back and forth. I hope you guys didn't get dizzy. It's kind of like watching tennis or something, going back and forth. But I hope that you got a little bit of a sense of the current state of digital ministry uh, from two very you know, different points of views, really, as, as uh, not opposing, but as Drew with, with a software company, um, consulting, and me more on the academic side, looking at it more in the form of statistics and surveys. Um, hopefully we've been able to present to you a, a coherent view of some of the current trends and things that are going on with digital ministry. And now we wrestle to see who wins. I thought we were gonna do our Backstreet Boys thing. <laughs> That's right. Um, questions or comments? It's hard to do that in a keynote. Yeah, yeah Antoine. Let me, let me ask a question about that. How many of you get texts from an organization or ministry where you get it regularly? So maybe a third, maybe 20%. Um, how many of you are like, I, I don't want any company or organization to text me? So about 80, three fourths. 80% or yeah. But how many of you raise your hand the first time and the second time? <laughs> like, how, how do I get off of this thing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, um, I, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I think the challenge is going to be 
uh, texting is there's a level of intimacy because of the closeness. And so if I was um, getting text a lot by a ministry organization, the likelihood of me you know, not wanting that is pretty high. Yeah. So, yeah. The other problem with text messaging, I think it's a valuable idea. Yeah. But the problem is, is that businesses are starting to get onto this too. And so there's now also a lot of talk about spamming yeah. through texting. And so it's a good market now. Yeah. But how long is it going to last? I don't know. People are going to get really irritated if they're getting spammed a lot yeah. from their text messaging. Yeah. So you got to be very careful when you make that decision to use a text yeah. message. I think an opt-in where people voluntarily sign up um, is one solution, though you have to be very, very um, careful about what you do with that information. Once you receive a cell phone number, you know, all you guys that signed up for this uh, conference text messaging thing, I'm selling those. Mm -hmm. okay? I'm getting like 100 bucks a number. <laughs> That's the average. Some to, people... To Chick-fil-A of all things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think text... Text messages, you know, I, I particularly could be a great bridge. Yeah. Great bridge. Just be intentional with yeah. the thing. Don't just use it to send blank, yeah. blanket messages, yeah. but specifically try to target the yeah. people that you're texting. I, I, yeah, match the intimacy with the content that is, is equals that, right? Yeah. So you've registered for this, you want this information, not, hey, this Thursday we've got a garage sale, and you're like, great. Yeah, exactly. That's so, awesome. Good, good points. Other things? Yes. How can we develop a global network of ministries so that we can be so intimate, intimate especially with people like from China, Australia, Africa, Europe, in very remote places where people feel that they are part of the big, the big community of the world? Prayer. I mean, I, I think that's, what you, that's a, a hugely ambitious thing. So, I mean, I know there's people that are wrestling through that. But I'm I don't asking, do you think it's worthwhile? Like through technologically, how do we do that? Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a technological challenge. I would. Yeah, it is. Um, two, two initiatives came out of the last two years, the Sonic yeah. Conference. Um, there was a very healthy discussion at the Sonic and how to hit um, primarily not English speaking groups, but the one digital ministry. Um, Jesus.net. Not so much that the technology is a problem, right. but it's consistent communication um, across regions where you don't have control of the access points. Um, but that's one effort that's been going on. Um, I would say in the background, but it's not really in the background. Um, very many ministries, a couple hundred of them, um, have prepared. that's been their modus operandi is to collaborate and connect and stay connected. I think a lot of organizations are, are trying to find a way to do that. You know, I might suggest you go to John Edmondson's sessions tomorrow. Yeah. He's going to do one on um, in, from information to transformation. I believe that's what he's calling it. Um, that might be a really excellent one to look at tomorrow. He's going to talk about things about, you know, he's an evangelist. He's been in the remotest parts of the world, and he loves technology, and he loves bringing those things together. So that might be a really good uh, session tomorrow. You're natural to plug uh, Faith Village right there, too. Maybe, maybe. I'm not sure Faith Village would work as a global community. That's an interesting point, though. Where, uh, where's our Faith Village guy? Good. You guys are ready for the movie. All right. Yeah. I'll take one more. One more question. We have a couple minutes still. Anyone? Uh, what I have in mind is that uh, the level of understanding is difficult of science in America is so high. Without them having the, the enough knowledge, then networking will not be possible. But so they training, do. Yeah, but they do know how to use text messaging and cell phones. That, I, that, I mean, I can't speak for every single person you're talking about, but that's, I mean, the literacy on cell phones is, I, I think, higher than literacy in speaking and writing and, so, and language. So if you, that's where I would start, would be in the ability to do text messaging or even using cell phones in some other way. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, you can get videos on those things. You can do a lot of different things. So that might be where, where I would think to look. What I have in mind is that if there could be a training 
through the, the website development before they can build the website. There is. They can educate themselves wherever they are, yeah. and then they can be updated so that they can John has been since join. Yeah. John, John may bring it up in his talk, um, but there has been a mobile ministry uh, training course that teaches just that. Um, how Not just how to use the technology, but how to develop the materials and develop pastoral quality. Yeah, John actually runs a class on how to do that, an online class. So, you know what, talk to me after, if you want, or tomorrow morning even, I'll get you hooked up with John, I'll introduce you. All right, All right. and with you. that, I think we probably want to wrap up. We have about Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.